So welcome everyone to our A to J author new user webinar. This is Jessica Frank, A to J author's project manager. Today we're going to talk about plain language for A to J guided interviews. On our agenda today, we'll define what plain language is, we'll talk about why it's necessary, how to apply it in drafting interview questions, and then we'll talk about tools both inside and outside of A to J author that can help you achieve your plain language goals. Plain language is clear, straightforward expression using only as many words as are necessary. It is language that avoids obscurity, inflated vocabulary, and convoluted sentence construction. It's not baby talk, and it's not a simplified version of the English language. Writers of plain English let their audience concentrate on the message instead of being distracted by complicated language. They make sure that their audience understands the message easily. Here are a couple of myths and their myth-busting facts about plain language. So the first myth is that plain language is simple-minded and talks down to people. However, the truth is that plain language includes and respects people. People understand what they read and they get the information they need without a lot of extras. The second myth is that plain language isn't necessary for people who read well. The fact is that plain language helps everyone understand what they read that people with good literary skills still skip over information, understand less, or just won't read a document that's too complex, wordy, or technical. Think about those click-through um, agreement terms when you start a new software program or um, you're reading through a website with the um, and have the cookies uh, notification pop up. A lot of people don't read those because they're overly complex, they're wordy, or they're technical. There's even the shorthand of TLDR, too long, don't read, um, for social media. So all of that's important to think about, that it's not just for those with um, a lower reading uh, level, it's for everyone. The Northwest Territories Literary Council is a Canadian organization that works with individuals and groups to promote and support literacy, literacy and essential skills. And they define plain language as writing for your readers. So plain language means you think about your readers and you pay attention to how you organize the information. So you tell your readers what the document is about, you help them find the information they need. You also pay attention to what you write. You include only the information your readers really need. You pay attention to how you write. You use words and grammar your readers understand and you speak directly to your reader. And finally, you pay attention to how you present the information. You use design techniques to help people read more easily. In 2002, a study was released by the National Center for Education Statistics. It was a $14 million five-year study where they interviewed over 90,000 adults in the United States. This was the most comprehensive study of literacy ever commissioned by the U.S. government. It found that nearly 50% of adults are functionally illiterate. That means they can't balance their checkbooks, they cannot read a drug label, or write an essay for a job. 21 to 23% of the adults were not able to locate information in text, they could not make low-level inferences using printed materials, and they were unable to integrate easily identifiable pieces of information. 41 to 44% of U.S. adults with the lowest level of literacy were living in poverty. There was a smaller follow-up study released in 2006 that showed no statistically significant improvement in U.S. adult literacy. So this is why it's necessary. More than 20% of adults read at or below a fifth grade level, which is generally far below the level you need to earn a living wage. 21 million Americans can't read at all. 45 million of them are marginally illiterate. One in five high school graduates cannot read their diploma. And while there are almost 750,000 words in the English language, about a third of all of our writing is made up of only 25 words. So let's talk about how to apply this information and these skills in your A to J guided interviews. A lot of these tips in the next couple of slides are ones that I've gotten from experienced authors and ones that I've come up with as I've worked on interview drafting. So first, let's talk about the overall design of questions. First, you want to keep your audience and your goal in mind. Consider the age, education, culture, and language of your users. One of, one of the great things that you can do is create a couple of user personas. So think about who the average person would be using your interview and come up with their backstory. 
to help include that age, education, culture, and language. So perhaps you're, you're automating a form to help someone with um, a child, uh, a change to how much child support that they get, child support modification. So um, one of your user personas could be um, Jane. Jane works at a dentist's office, is a receptionist. She has access to a computer in her home um, and at work, but she's only able to work on the interview during her lunch break and once her two kids go to sleep um, at night. She at work isn't going to have access to all of the documents she has at home, but maybe she can finish it up later. And um, maybe Jane is has a col or has a high school education, but she never f completed college. So that's one of your user personas. Then that's um, who you're going to work towards drafting your questions. You're going to include things like the ability to save um, a list of all the things she's going to need before she sits down, because you know she only has a half an hour during her lunch break to work on this. Then you can create another user persona of um, another common person that might be using this, whether they potentially don't have English as their first language. Um, they only are going to be doing this on their mobile phone. You want to have maybe two or three um, common user personas that um, cover the, the range of people who are potentially using your interview. And then you can test your interviews in that mind frame of that person. And so that'll really help make sure that your interview is focused on the audience and the goal of what they're trying to accomplish with the automated document. You always want to include instructions on how to complete the forms. You can group you can group questions. Um, and the fun part about automated documents is that they don't, the form itself doesn't govern anymore. You are the control here. And so if the form has information about the spouse on page one, five, and seven, you get to group all of the spouse questions in the automated form. You can ask all the questions about their kids in one section, all the questions about property, all their information. The form doesn't dictate. So you can group the questions in a way that gives your user, um, has them just thinking about that one topic at a time without jumping all over the place. But in the template, in the form that gets printed, you can put all of those answers wherever the court has them in the court form. When you're drafting questions, you want to give context to each set of questions, which allows you to transition smoothly from one topic to the next. So just like a well-written legal memo has transitions between paragraphs and sections, you want to apply that same idea to drafting your interviews. So next, I'm going to talk to you about your kids. We finished talking about your children. Now I'm going to move on and talk about your spouse. We finished talking about your spouse and your children. Now I'm going to talk to you about the legal issue. Each one of those tells them you're starting a new section, so it gives them a frame of mind as you're likely moving on to a new step in your interview. Um, so they're finishing one thought and then they're being told what the next thing to focus on is. And it just allows them to move smoothly in, uh, throughout the interview. When you start, you want to begin with easy and safe questions. The first question on your form shouldn't be, um, you know, why are you late on your child support? Um, for a child support modification, or what's your social security number? Those kind of questions are off-putting. You want to ease your end user in with easy, safe questions. Once they start to trust the process, then you can ask those more difficult questions that need to be answered for the forms. You can use bold, but use it sparingly. So same with capitalization. So think about one word or one item that you're emphasizing per question or per page. Don't use bold or capitals to um, quote unquote yell at someone on the internet, but it can be great for emphasizing. You can also balance interesting question formats with consistency. A to J author allows you 14 different field types in which to ask questions plus buttons. Um, so it gives you a lot of flexibility in how you want to present your question to your end user and the information. However, you probably shouldn't use all 15 of those options. Um, instead, um, you can have radio buttons, you can have check boxes, you can have fields, you can have buttons that gather information and move the end user. Um, so balance out the different formats and chime out and how it fits your interview style but sort of keep a consistent look throughout. And you can always add images or videos to the learn more sections because a picture or a video is worth a thousand words. It's always a great way to add more information in a different way for the end user. Some people are more visual and it helps break up a lot of that text. Next, let's talk about the order of the questions. The great part about an automated forms project, like I said, is that the form doesn't control anymore. You as the author can order the questions however you want to make them easy for your user to understand and complete. So at the beginning of the interview, 
you'd like you likely will want to have a checklist of things that the user needs instructions on how to use the interview you want to get any of those qualification or eligibility questions off right away you don't want someone to spend 20 minutes completing a form just to find out they're in the wrong jurisdiction or they make too much money or um, this isn't the correct form for their legal problem whatever that point in which it would kick them out make sure you get that out of the way early on so you're not wasting people's time with uh, the instructions on how to use the interview, sometimes that's good at the beginning to sort of explain the software. So there's pop-ups, there's learn more, there's the back button, there's save and exit, however you want to describe how to use A to J Author. But there's also instructions about what to do later. So at the end of the interview, if there's something that the end user still needs to do, like this isn't just um, a, an online intake that's going to get submitted when they click, you know, submit my information. Uh, if they're going to need to do something with the physical paper that's generated afterwards um, or the digital copy, um, make sure to tell them that at the end, too. So, um, you know, after you complete this form and get your documents, make sure to print three copies, get, you know, two of them notarized, keep one copy for yourself, whatever you need to do that the court process is afterwards. You can include those instructions, instructions at the end of the interview as well. You can also include them in your template so that they print out as instructions for the end user along with their court documents. But then finally, back to the beginning, you always want to have a hook. Explain to the end user why they're putting the effort into doing whatever they're doing. So you're going to spend the next 20 to 30 minutes or three hours or 10 minutes, however long it takes. You're going to spend the next X amount of time. Uh, answering a series of questions back and forth and learning more about you know, the legal process involved in your X problem. At the end, you're going to have all of the paperwork necessary to do and whatever it is. That simple hook um, explains how much effort they're going to have to put into it, generally how long it's going to take, it's a rough estimate, and what they're going to get out of it at the end. So that the end user knows when they invest this time, they're going to have all of the stuff they need to do X. Moving on to uh, sensitive questions, the technique here is to start off with a neutral and get harder. So just like um, asking questions in an easy and safe way at the beginning and then getting harder, same idea. Right off the bat, you don't have to um, start with those hard, hardball questions. You can uh, start off with neutral questions, you know, explaining the process, getting them on the hook, telling them what instructions they have, what organization you're from, and then you can build up to those harder questions that are needed on the form. And this is always an opportunity for advocacy. I mentioned social security number, and this might be some, some place and some organizations have taken that as an opportunity for advocacy in that courts still require the social security number on the form to be turned in. But when they did their user personas, they thought about how um, this is going to be somebody who's filling it out on a court kiosk or a library computer terminal where they might not know how to clear the cache or their browser history or to clear out that personal information. And social security numbers are um, easy pickings for identity theft. And so they, this organization decided to stop asking for social security numbers in the automated document, but in their instructions at the end and the ones that print out, explain to, to the end user to hand write in that social security number before they submit their documents to the court. So the form still gets completed all the way through, but the organization has decided that they're just not going to automate some parts of that form because of um, their user persona and how they see this form being used. So those are small opportunities for advocacy. On the individual question level, you want to accommodate all possible answers. Allow for that I don't know or that other. Be careful about assuming what a user knows. So just because you as a lawyer or a law student or a court personnel know uh, what county you live in or, you know, know offhand what your zip code is based on your address, that's not always something that everyone would have access to or, or remember in a stressful situation. Maybe they're doing this at a court kiosk. They've just been told, you know, whatever they were trying to do didn't work and now they have to go work on this other project this other program they're stressed out they are in this legal situation you know they took a day off work they're flustered allow your end user to put an i don't know or an other um, for those kind of scenarios but also give them the additional help that they can need, that they might need to answer that question so it's really simple to li link out um, in the us to the usps 
.gov website so that someone can look up based on their address, their zip code, or look up a county for your state. Whatever it is, you can add those in a learn more or a, a hyperlink within the text to shoot them off to another website. They can quickly come back with the information they need. Questions should not rely on previous questions. So um, if you have to ask a follow-up question or a question that is uh, sub or relies on some other previous information they've already given you. You can use macros to do to call out the information they've already told you. And if you're interested in learning how to do macros, we have a training video on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash a to j author. We also have on our website, the, the authoring guide under the learn tab has a whole section on macros. But macros pull out information the end user has already told you, it's already stored in a variable, and you can redisplay it to the end user to remind them. And that's particularly helpful when you're asking them to rely on that previous information to answer a follow-up question. Avoid ranking questions by importance. Be careful about leading language. Make sure to eliminate surplus words and omit unnecessary detail. And the goal is that fifth to seventh grade reading level. Now, um, remember or think about that shorter isn't always better. So here's a definition on the top in the white box um, for a legal guardian. The top one says a legal guardian has the authority and duty to care for the personal and property interests of another person. It's rated at a college level, so 13.5 grade level. Now, if we look at the longer definition in the gray box, a legal guardian acts as a parent for another person. The guardian must care for and make decisions for that person. For example, the guardian must make sure the person is properly fed, clothed, housed, and goes to school. The guardian has the power to make property, medical care, and schooling decisions for that person. The second definition is longer, but it's in that target seventh grade reading level. It includes examples to make the definition more concrete for the end user. A great place to add this additional information, like the bottom example in your A to J guided interviews, is in that learn more section. So the learn more section is the pop-up that is next to the end user, sort of the thought that the end user avatar has and the answer that the guide avatar gives. The learn more allows you to add this just-in-time learning feature to your interview questions at the point in which the end user needs it. Um, so as they're answering the question about what is a legal guardian, you can have a learn more that explains that definition. You could also, if your question said, who do you want to be your child's legal guardian? You can have a pop-up, which provides the definition if the end user needs it. So legal guardian would be underlined in blue, like a hyperlink. If the end user needed that information, they would click it and up would pop a pop-up with a definition like the gray box with examples, if you wanted to include those as well. Here's just a quick little exercise to show you how to translate common legalese phrases into plain language. So like appear in person becomes come to court. Dissolution of matrimony is divorce. Each party shall retain records of all expenditures is means keep records of your bills. Not seeking relief, they don't want anything. And an unfavorable decision in your legal matter means you lost. So this is just an easy way to turn what are legal terms into what are more commonly known ways of saying the same thing. So that's important exercise to do potentially in your interviews to translate those legal terms. Sometimes you can't translate it. Sometimes it matters if the person is the petitioner or the respondent. If you can't change those words into something that is more commonly understood, always include a pop-up with the definition so that a person can make the correct decision based on additional information about what that means in the legal setting. So in our last section for today, I'm gonna to talk about tools that can help you to create interviews in plain language. The first one is uh, tools within A to J Author that are meant to help you. So we've built a grade level evaluator into the, age, into the A to J Author full reports. The full reports found under the reports tab in your interview include a word count, an average word per sentence count, the Flesh Kincaid Grade Level Evaluator, and the Coleman Lau Grade Level Evaluator. These tools evaluate the text of your interview questions, the Learn More prompts, the Learn More response, and any pop-ups that you have as well. Each text chunk is individually evaluated, but also at the very end, you get a grade level for your entire interview. You get the system itself gives you visual clues with green, yellow, or red text to alert you to text box that exceed the recommended fifth grade reading level. 
You get a warning yellow for anything that is between a 6.0 and an 8.9 grade level. Anything 9.0 and over turns it red. And the great part about this is you can print this full report with the grade level evaluators in it. And by print, you can also save it as a PDF. It opens in a separate screen to print when you click print preview. Um, and you can share this with any of your subject matter experts or anyone that might be testing the interview for you outside of the software. So this lets them have that additional information in you as well to review your text. And then if you make changes and you go back to the full report, those will be um, updated as well. The first outside tool to talk about is really not outside A to J author land completely. It's the writeclearly.org's plain language online course. This was created um, about a decade ago by Jeff Hogue, formerly of Lonnie, um, and Transcend, Transcend Translations, and John Mayer, who is the executive director of Cali, which is A to J author's parent organization. This three-part course is written in Cali Author, which is Ada J Author's sister software. It's used, uh, Cali Author is generally used by law students to learn legal concepts and do online lessons for law school. But this Write Clearly project walks you through three lessons on plain language tailored for the legal aid and automated document communities. And you can find all three lessons on our website at adajauthor.org slash plain underscore language underscore course. There are also the federal plain language guidelines from the U.S. government. This document was initially developed under the Clinton administration and then continued through the Obama administration. It includes tips on thinking about your audience, organizing the document or an interview in our case, using the active voice, minimizing abbreviations, and omitting unnecessary words and details. And you can find the full document at uh, plainlanguage.gov slash guidelines. There's also um, additional information about plain language and trainings on that website as well. Finally, there's Trans Transcend Translations. They're a great company that's worked with many legal aid organizations and courts to improve their plain language. I talked about them partnering with Lonnie and Callie for the plain language course just two slides ago. Um, but their website here, transcend.net, has articles explaining why plain language is important. They've done side-by-side -side evaluations of court forms before plain language or after, before and afters of court forms. Um, they have articles talking about the advantages of plain language. So if you have to pr um, potentially sell this to somebody else about why it's important to spend the time doing plain language, this is a great resource for you. And they also have a plain language lesson on their YouTube channel, which is linked from their website under services um, and then plain language. So um, if you do have questions throughout the month or anytime you're working on your interviews, feel free to email me, jessica at cali.org. I'm always happy to help um, with specific interviews or with the planning of the interview drafting process. Um, so feel free to reach out to me at any time. If there aren't any questions, um, thank you all for attending and uh, happy October. See you all in November. Thanks.